What's up everybody, GenX Dividend Investor here. In this video I'll be answering 7 subscriber questions that were sent to me, covering really interesting topics like my perspective on investing in SIN stocks as well as a slew of others. Then I'll end this video with a valuable life story that is worth hearing and reflecting on. If you'd like me to potentially answer a question of yours in a future Millionaire Dividend Investing Questions and Answers video, then follow me on Instagram at GenX Dividend Investor and DM me your questions. Please consider hitting the thumbs up button, subscribing if you haven't, and click that bell notification. Finally, I'm not a financial advisor, so take my responses as entertainment only, not as a way to make financial decisions. Okay, my first question comes from Jake. He said, question for a future video, what are the best options for fixed income in a portfolio for dividends? How do you go about adding fixed income to your portfolio? Alternatively, same question for international stocks. Thanks, Jake. So fixed income investing focuses on preservation of capital and income. It's often way less risky than stocks, and it includes things like government and corporate bonds, CDs, and money market funds. You can search for income funds, and you'll find products from BlackRock or Vanguard, like VCLT, which is Vanguard's long-term corporate bond fund. I personally don't invest that way. Now, risk is an interesting word. One could argue that in the long run, you're exposing yourself to more risk by not investing more aggressively. But for some retirees or risk-averse individuals, they opt to beat inflation with fixed income investments, which end up working really nicely during periods of stock market crashes. When interest rates were higher in the past, I have been known to put money in CDs, treasury bonds, and money market funds. I also like to keep some cash on hand in higher yield online savings accounts, even though these days their returns are a joke with interest rates being so low. I personally am fine taking risks with stocks like J&J &J or utilities like Southern Company in order to get a higher, but relatively safe, return rather than go into fixed income investments. Even though I like to think of utilities as the bonds of my portfolio, they obviously aren't as safe. We saw what happened to PG&E Corporation, ticker PCG, which stands for Pacific Gas and Electric and is a utility in California that was trading at $70 three years ago with a nice dividend, but today is barely over $10 a share with no dividends. What happened was that they started a 2018 wildfire that killed dozens of people, unfortunately. So utilities aren't as safe as bonds, but edge cases like PCGs are relatively rare. Of course, some people feel that even U.S. Treasuries aren't safe and the U.S. currency isn't safe because of the huge debt, deficits, etc. I'm personally not that big of an alarmist, or maybe I should say I believe in American businesses more than that. I am long Bitcoin because I'm fine risking a small portion of my money on something super speculative that I both technically understand and I think I can make money on, not because I think the U.S. currency system will become like Venezuela's or something. Now regarding international stocks, if you watch my lengthy deep analysis videos, you'll see that many of my investments are, in essence, international because of their revenue. Take McDonald's for example. I'm fine putting most of my eggs primarily into American markets, though I am long on some Chinese stocks, even though I have concerns about how the business and auditing is done there. If I were to invest more internationally, I would look to someone like Vanguard and consider their products like VGTSX or VTIAX, which are international total stock market funds. The next question comes from Jeff. He said, Hey GenX, if I may, why do you invest into stocks like Apple and Microsoft? The yield is low, and it doesn't have the long-term dividend CAGR of, say, Starbucks or Home Depot, which are close to 20%, but I'm sure you have a good reason that these are your largest holdings. Thanks. I'm also holding on to Disney. I figure maybe they'll get back to distributing dividends in the next year or two, and the dividend growth might make up for the suspension. Otherwise, it's an interesting stock. Thanks, Jeff. So, I have a variety of goals with my portfolios, such as wanting a certain amount of dividend income, of which I live off of, or wanting capital appreciation, or etc. In the end, your total portfolio value is one of the most important metrics, as that gives you options to do whatever you want, as you can always move into other asset classes or other stocks, and of course you can always raise or lower your portfolio's yield. Let's take my number one position, Apple. I have over 200% returns in under two years. I originally only invested around 67 k into it, which would have made it my 14th largest position at that time, but now it's moved into number one worth over 200 k It could fall 50% from where it is today and I'd still have an amazing return. So I could sell it and drive that money into higher yielding stocks, and I've created a video called When to Sell a Stock, which explains the reasons why I sell, but at this point I don't need to. A mistake I sometimes see is people selling their winners and investing more in their losers. Even that can make sense depending on your goals and how things play out. Microsoft is my best returning stock of all time. In the last year alone I'm up over 33%, but my first tranche from the 1990s is up like a thousand percent or something insane. Watch my video called The Time I Sold Out of All My Stocks to hear how I got out and back into Microsoft. My background is in tech and that's my primary circle of competence, and thus investing in Apple and Microsoft is something I understand and believe in. I think Microsoft is the best tech dividend growth stock out there, and while I don't see the same growth possibilities at this point in time with Apple, 
I do see massive earnings continue to flow in, which is part of why I feel confident in it as a dividend play as well. I'm guessing that both companies will keep raising their dividends at 10% a year or so, which is an awesome CAGR, and I'd bet that Home Depot and Starbucks may start slowing down. Now I love Home Depot and Starbucks as well, but over the super long term I have more confidence in something like a Microsoft. In terms of Disney, I think it's my favorite generational stock out there, dividends or not, and I think they're going to keep crushing it with their new focus on streaming, and eventually their dividends will come back, either in my lifetime or my kids. Speaking of Disney, I just found out that they're planning a new series that will apparently only be released on their Disney Plus streaming platform, and it'll be called Kenobi, and it'll star a familiar face in Ewan McGregor. The rumor is that Kenobi will take place 8 years after Revenge of the Sith, which means it's 11 years before A New Hope, and that period is an era after the Jedi Order was wiped out. And I think Kenobi will be released in late 2021 or early 2022, and I'll definitely be watching it with my son. I watched Survivor with my daughter, and then I watched The Bachelor and Bachelorette with my wife. It's always fun to have something to look forward to. Okay, let's move on. The next question comes from Tim and is a short one. He said, are you worried about AT&T? Thanks Tim, no, I'm not worried. Quite the contrary, I'm very excited for AT&T now more than ever and I'm contemplating investing more at these levels. They are committed to driving down debt and are succeeding. They are selling non-core assets. They are refinancing their existing debt at ridiculously low rates. Rewind back a few years and they had a similar debt profile but had multiple percent higher interest obligations. I think 5-15 to 15 years from now AT&T will be in quite an amazing place if they can continue on their current path. That being said, history doesn't show they can execute, thus their stock has taken what hit that it deserves. But I'm betting that between stock appreciation and yield, I will love my AT&T investments as the decades go on, and more importantly, so will my kids. Okay, the next question comes from Track Savvy. He said, If I have credit card debt but I want to invest in stocks, should I just focus on knocking down my debt first, then invest, or should I do both? Thanks Track Savvy. Since you didn't include any data on how much debt you have or the terms, let's make some assumptions. If you watched my video called How I Got an 850 FICO Credit Score, you would have learned that an average American has something like $6,500 in credit card debt, and the average rates that people are charged are around 18%. The average stock market return is about 10% per year for nearly the last century, though returns in any year are far from average. By that I mean it can swing up or down, so you can never assume that 10% will happen every year. Nor can you rest assured that what happened in the last 100 years will happen the next 100. So just looking at those data points, I'd say pay off your higher interest rate debt, and then once your credit cards are paid off, pay off any other high interest debt, and then save for an emergency fund, and then start investing. I know that's not as fun, but that's what I would do. Okay, let's move on. The next question comes from Victor, who asked, Just wondering how you picked your mix of stocks. Hey Victor, thanks for your question. So over the years I've done a decent amount of research on how much diversification makes sense in a portfolio, covering things like pros and cons of being in different sectors, what size your position should be, etc. And I've also kept a pulse on what makes a good dividend stock or a good growth stock, and then taking all those things into consideration is how I've settled on where I am today. I'm in most sectors and I roughly align to something like VU, and I go overweight in sectors I like more and go with companies I've researched and like their trends and believe in their futures, yet I'm not in too many that I can't still follow news on them. There are a lot of companies I don't materially invest in, and I say materially because I have smaller positions in other stocks that I got through things like Bumped, which unfortunately just changed their business model. So for example, I officially own some Walmart stock, and I officially own some Nike stock, but they aren't material amounts, so I don't include them on my spreadsheet or talk about them. The next question comes from Albert, who said, Hey Gen X, I've been thinking about investing in some sin stocks like tobacco, but when I mentioned that to my best friend, he chewed me out. What are your thoughts about investing in tobacco? So that's a great question. First of all, I personally wouldn't care too much if my friend got irked in what I was investing in, just like I don't get irked to hear what he invests in. A real friend will remain your friend regardless. Some of my best friends are hardcore in supporting other political parties, and yet we still remain friends and talk about our perspectives. One funny thing about tobacco stocks is that investors often don't realize that many of their investments are directly or indirectly supported and benefit from tobacco products. What do I mean? Well, for example, 7-Eleven is a key tenant of realty income. They are also one of the nation's largest retailers of tobacco products. Walmart is the other big retailer. So by investing in realty income, some of your profits are enabled due to a big revenue source that a key customer of theirs has, which is tobacco. But the rabbit hole supply chain goes much deeper. Like think about how tobacco products get to where they're going. By rail, trucks, planes, using gasoline, backed up by logistics companies and a slew of others in the overall supply chain. What else enables and supports and makes money from tobacco companies? Well banks do, by loaning them money and helping them make their deals, etc. What about advertising? Even Berkshire owns media that advertises tobacco. By the way, I'm also long Berkshire in my non-dividend portfolio for full transparency. 
And then beyond that, many of the classic ETFs hold big tobacco stocks like VU and SPY and such. So I think almost every investor out there is either directly or indirectly investing in industries that benefit or enable tobacco, though many don't realize that. I think that the pros and cons of smoking are pretty well understood these days, and I'm someone who values the freedom of choice people have in what they eat or smoke or whatever, and as long as it isn't affecting someone else. My dad used to smoke. I have a relative who has smoked her whole life and has cancer now. I've never been a cigarette smoker. Well, that's not totally true. I'll tell you something gross I did when I was 10. I went camping with my parents and was brushing my teeth in the restrooms and noticed a burning cigarette that was left on a countertop by someone who was taking a shower. So as a stupid kid, I decided to take a puff. Of course I hated it, and yes, you can stop vomiting now because I think it's gross too. I've never actually told anyone that disgusting little story. Oh, and one other time I smoked a cigarette at a Rush concert. But come on, it was Rush. Anyways, I understand the addictive nature of tobacco and fault that industry for not being transparent decades ago, but I also value freedoms and value people who practice moderation. I also realize that's easier said than done, as someone who's been addicted to various things. So to be clear, I don't advocate smoking and I know it's bad for your health, but I think if you want to invest in it, that's fine, and if you don't want to, that's fine. But I would invest based on what floats your boat and on what you think you make money on, not on what others say. Okay, that was deep. That's what she said. Let's move on. The final question comes from Eric, who said, Hey Gen X, first of all, you're my favorite channel on YouTube, and that's saying something as I watch a lot. I've been sharing your channel with all my friends and I just want to say thank you so much for answering these questions. Secondly, I wanted to get your take on my situation. I hate my job but I'm making a lot of money. I'm working 80 hours a week and the environment is toxic. I have an option to take a job which I think I'd like, but I'd make around half the salary. Do you think it's smarter to tough it out and then put more money into investments or would you go after the better work-life balance? Thanks Eric, I really appreciate you giving me that incredible compliment. Hearing something like that really makes my day. So I've been in work situations where I made good money, but I hated it and felt the environment was bad for my soul, and I stuck it out, but looking back I think that was a mistake. You probably need to search for something you love and can make money in. I'm not talking about if you had a single bad day or had an annoying conversation, I'm talking about soul draining toxicity. Bottom line, I think if you intelligently explore your options, then trying to find something you are passionate about, in the long run, is the smarter decision. By intelligently I mean I would make sure I had enough income to ensure I was okay before I walk away unless it was so detrimental to my mental well-being that I felt I'd rather take financial risk over mental risk. Jim Carrey has some great advice where he says that you can fail at what you don't want to do, like a job you hate, so you might as well take that chance at doing something you love. Also, Gary Vee has some great videos you should watch where he talks about how you need to focus on happiness over money, and how you can start profitable businesses around your passions, whether that's Pokemon cards or collecting stickers or creating canoes. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears and tell you a valuable story about life I found online that is worth hearing and reflecting on. A father and his 24-year-old son were sitting on a train, watching the scenery shoot by. The son gleefully said, Dad, look, the trees are going behind. The father smiled, but a young couple sitting nearby looked at the 24-year-old's childish behavior with pity. Suddenly, the young man blurted out again, Dad, look, the clouds are running with us. The couple couldn't resist and said to the father, Why don't you take your son to a good doctor? The old man smiled and said, I did and we were just coming from the hospital. My son was blind from birth and just got his eyes today. Moral of the story? Every single person on the planet has a story. Don't judge people before you truly know them. The truth might surprise you. I've made that mistake multiple times in my life and learned over time how wrong I was to quickly assume things about people. Now, this is a quick add-on response to Jake. There is a risky income ETF to evaluate, which a lot of folks are talking about, and that's QYLD, which currently has an insane yield at around 12% and is a monthly payer. It attempts to generate income through covered call writing, which historically produces higher yields during periods of volatility. They have a relatively short history and have been paying distributions for only about six years. It has a decently high expense ratio at around 0.66%. Their top 10 holdings are companies you'll recognize like Apple and Microsoft and such. I'll say this isn't one I can recommend as I've not studied it enough and I frankly don't get what happens to their dividend payment if the stocks it holds are falling significantly and they are trying to pay at the money covered calls. I mean isn't the cost basis too high to make money? What I will say is that I want to research this one more to understand it, and I'd say it is a much riskier product than something like a J&J. I don't see much stock appreciation at all with QYLD, but I do see lots of potential income, though again, risk. I just wanted to mention it as something I personally want to dig deeper into, but I can't recommend it to others. Okay, I'd like to call out my latest Patreon champions for signing up. So thank you to Shuggy, who just signed up, as well as thank you to Boros, who also just joined the ranks of people who are directly supporting my mission to spread the word about investing. Thanks, fellas. I really appreciate your support. And thank you to you, the viewer, for watching my video. Please consider hitting the thumbs up button, subscribing if you haven't, and click the bell notification. 
I highly recommend that you join my free Dividend Discord chat server, which has thousands of dividend investors on it and is growing all the time. The link is in the description below if you'd like to join. Remember to click the heart emoji on the screen to get authorized, or you can wait for me to manually authorize you, which I'll usually do within an hour. By the way, if you'd like to more directly support me in a simple way, then consider clicking on my Amazon affiliate link in the description of this video and then go shopping online. As an Amazon associate, I earn from qualifying purchases, which means I get a small commission after you click on my link and then shop for whatever you need, and it doesn't even impact the prices you pay. Finally, if you'd like me to potentially answer a question of yours in a future Millionaire Dividend Investing Questions and Answers video, then follow me on Instagram at GenXDividendInvestor and DM me your questions. Thanks, and I'll talk to you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.